I welcome everyone this morning to a session of excellence in life and ministry. Amen. And I pray that the intention of the Lord, the purpose of the Lord, and the reason for bringing you here at this time, that the Lord will accomplish and fulfill in your life in Jesus' name. Amen. That the word, the sentence, the passage that is meant for you in particular, the Lord will register on your heart. Amen. And by His grace, anointing, and unction, you will run, you will not be weary. Amen. You will walk in this way, you will not be tired in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you at this time and bless your name. We thank you because you have a purpose. And today is not just a passing time, just to fulfill our righteousness and just to be here and quickly rush on to another thing. Lord, we give you all our heart, all our attention. All ears were open, and we're praying, Lord, you speak directly to every heart, what will benefit every one of us, and prepare us for a greater ministry ahead in Jesus' name. Amen. Bless us, that we might become blessings to other people. Amen. In Jesus' name, we pray. God bless you. You can sit down. Today we're coming to the second session in our series of developing what it means to be a man of destiny, having an excellent ministry, an excellent life, and then an excellent ministry. The life goes along with the ministry. If you don't have an excellent life, you cannot jump over and great crash into an excellent ministry. So combine those two things in your mind, in your heart, in your focus, in your ministry. The life and the ministry. The man and the ministry. And as you do that, and you aim at having a an excellent life, excellent, not in the sight of man alone, because man looks on the outward profession, outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. In the sight of God, in the sight of heaven, in the private, in the public, anywhere you are, alone by yourself and with other people, in your thinking, in your planning, in your communication with the Lord, in your communication interaction with people, around you live excellent and now the ministry stretching forth a hand to help to lead and to bless other people you have the ministry excellent and it is when those two sides are combined and we have the life the ministry combined together not one running ahead of the other sometimes the ministry runs ahead of the life the life is not being developed and the life is not excellent and the life is nothing to write uh, home about but the ministry is galloping and is reaching on slow down come back and let life merge and meet with the ministry then we have a man that's excellent in life in his family excellent in life in his profession excellent in life in the world in which he lives and then excellent in ministry i pray that the lord will accomplish and fulfill that in every one of our lives in jesus name and it just say good amen. amen. Today we're talking about the complete cycle of an excellent, enduring ministry. That those uh, three words at the beginning very important. The complete cycle. When you draw a circle, everything is round, rounded up. 
and it's complete you complete the circle and when we talk of a cycle you really you have you know my motorcycle and you know the bicycle now we have the tires there they are on if any spoke is broken or a patch of the tire is cut off and you just have a sector a section and it's not a complete cycle then you cannot even ride and in ministry except our ministry is rounded up and it's a complete cycle we cannot even have a ministry in the sight of god and neither can we have a complete and excellent enduring ministry in the sight of the people who are ministering to what's still considered in Moses. And I told you yesterday there is transferable concept. And everything we have in Moses, and we see in Moses, we want to take that and apply it to our lives and have a complete understanding of the complete cycle of an excellent enduring ministry i'm coming to exodus chapter 3 and i'm reading the first part of verse 8 it says and i am come this is the almighty talking to moses this is god the creator the redeemer talking to moses and he says i am come down to deliver them to deliver the children of israel out of the hand of the egyptians and to bring them up out of the land unto a good land and a large into you look at that word is bringing them out that's the first part and it's bringing them unto into a land flowing with milk and honey out of that's not the whole ministry into it is when we complete that they are brought out and they are brought into then we have a complete cycle i want you to look at uh, verse 10 there in verse 10 it says come now therefore and i will send thee unto pharaoh that thou mayest bring forth my people the children of israel out of Egypt out of Egypt please understand that whatever Moses did and whatever we do while we're still in Egypt that's good but then we have not started the ministry until we bring the people out of out of and then we have not completed the ministry until we bring them into and so we need to understand and analyze very well what am i doing what has he done he brought them out of so that he might bring them into the land the lord had prepared for them in deuteronomy chapter 6 reading from verse 23 deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 23 look at this and he brought us out out from this that's the first part and that first part needs to be underlined and emphasized underscored that he brought us out from this that he might bring us in look at that he brought us out for the reason for the purpose that he might bring us in to give us the land which is where unto our fathers the complete cycle that you bring them out and then you bring them into in jeremiah chapter 2 reading from verse 6 jeremiah chapter 2 reading from verse 6 it says neither said thee where is the lord that brought us up out of the land of egypt always always they draw the circle the beginning the continuation and then the end of it it says neither did they say where is the lord that brought us up out of the land of egypt that led us through the wilderness in your bible you want to underline the first part out of and then you want to underline through through the wilderness he brought us out first part 
He took us through the wilderness, second part, through a land of deserts and of peaks, through a land of drought and of the shadow of death, through a land that no man passes through and where no man dwelt, no man dwelt. Now, the children of Israel, as Moses who used of God, they were brought out and he led, he led them through the wilderness. They were not to dwell in the wilderness. The wilderness is not a place for the people of God to stay and to abide. It says, where no man dwelt, and so, if they were brought out, and as they go to the wilderness, they saw that, you know, it looks like even though this is wilderness, we're like this, we're like this, we're like that, and they dwell there, and they stay there, the ministry would not have been completed. We need to finish that circle, and we need to complete that cycle that we're out we're through, and then we're coming to look at verse 7. In verse 7, and I brought you into a plentiful country. Underline the word into. Those words are very important. The first one, out of. The second one, through. And then the third one, into. And as you look at your ministry, you want to emphasize that to yourself. And you want to evaluate your ministry as to what you're doing out of and through. And then we have into. In the New Testament, the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, that's what he did. Number one, he said, I have chosen you out of the world out of the world out of the world we have to be converted we have to be saved we have to be born again and we need to come out of sin out of evil out of spiritual egypt and out of the world and then how to live the life he gave them to live i'm crucified with christ nevertheless i live and yet not i it is christ that lives in me and the life i now live I live, I live, we're going through, we're going through life, and I live by the grace, by the faith of the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who died for me, out of through and then as they prayed the high priestly prayer in john chapter 17 he said father i will that the people you have given me may be with me and see my glory he was to bring them into the promised land in heaven theologically we say number one justification out of Number two, sanctification. It takes us through. And then number three is glorification. Justification. That we're justified by faith. And we repent of our sins. We believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're saved. We're justified. It is that justification that begins the ministry. Justification and then sanctification. We're sanctified. And we live in sanctified righteousness holy life because he'll deliver us from our enemies that we might serve him in righteousness and holiness all through our lives before him sanctification then glorification when we go with him and when the saints are going in marching in then we're there the cycle is completed in your ministry then if you're going to have an excellent enduring ministry and you're going to have the cycle that cycle to be complete justification one sanctification two glorification number three today as we look at the message the complete cycle of an excellent enduring ministry we're looking at three things here number one the urgent ministry bring people out of bondage egypt was a bondage for the children of israel and when people are still in sin they're in bondage and you want to bring them out of that's number one number two is the uppermost mandate bring 
pilgrims pilgrims are the people they're walking through the barren land they're walking through the wilderness it says uh, number two the uppermost mandate bring uh, pilgrims through the barren land they don't stay there the barren land the wilderness they don't live there they don't dwell there they don't pitch their tents there we're going through and you want to take them through number three the ultimate mastery the ultimate mastery bring them purified into Beulah, Beulah land in Isaiah that depicts seven and that reveals seven where we're taking them to. If you provide everything here on earth, if you have everything here on earth and you don't make it on the final day to heaven, then we've we'll wasted life, we've we'll wasted ministry, we've we'll wasted our resources. Number three then is the ultimate mandate that you bring them purified into Beulah. We're looking at number one. Number one, the urgent ministry. Bring people out of bondage. As we look at that, we're looking at it under three perspectives. Number one, to bring people out of Egypt. Number two, to blot out Egypt from the minds of the people. Take them out of Egypt and take Egypt out of them. If Egypt is not taken out of those Israelites, they have not really totally completely come out of Egypt. But you take Egypt out of them. And number three, to bind the people to the eternal. You take them out of Egypt, you take Egypt out of them, and you bind them unto the eternal. As we look at your ministry you ask yourself really the people do they understand they are out of the world and the world is out of them and they cleave unto the word of God that is the summary of their coming out of Egypt and coming out of the world look at number one to bring the people out of Egypt. We're looking at Exodus chapter 6, reading from verse 13. Exodus chapter 6, from verse 13. And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron and gave them a charge unto the children of Israel and unto Pharaoh king of Egypt to bring the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. He gave them a charge. A charge is not a suggestion. A charge is not an opinion. A charge is not a topic for debate. A charge is a commandment. A charge is a commission. Moses, this is why I called you. Aaron, this is why I brought you to partner with Moses. And Moses and Aaron, this is the charge you have. And you yourself, your mind, your heart has to be taken away from Egypt. Because if Moses himself, if he loved Egypt and he wanted something in Egypt, God cannot send him and say that thing that is uppermost in your heart, you want to be an Egyptian, remain in Egypt. Now go and take the Israelites out of Egypt. If the minister is still in the world and is still entrenching the world, the traditions of the world, the ideology of the world, the principles of the world, the practices of the world, the festivities of the world, they're still within him. How can such a minister that's of the world himself, of the world herself, how can she, how can he bring the people out of the world, out of Egypt? And so the Lord commanded a charge he gave him, and a charge he has given you, a charge he has given every one of us that will bring the people 
out of the world, out of sin. Now, the Satan is the God of this world. And if we're bringing the people out of Egypt and out of, under the control of Pharaoh, you're bringing the people out of the world and out of the dominion or domination or the control or the influence of the God of this world. It tells us in verse 26 of that same chapter, these are that Aaron and Moses to whom the Lord said, bring out the children of Israel from the land of Egypt according to their armies. All of them, you bring them out. It tells us in um, John chapter 8 and i'm reading from verse 32 we now under the new covenant in the new testament what are we to do exactly the same thing it says and you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free free from egypt free from the world free from the practices and free from the traditions and the religion of the world. The world has religion like Egypt had religion and Moses was to bring them out of everything that, that smells of Egypt and we are called to bring the people out of everything related to the world. We're looking at verse 33 there it says and, and they answered him will be Abraham's seed and were not never in bondage to any man. <laughs> they were lying because, <clears throat> excuse me, God bless you. They were in bondage in Egypt, in bondage to the Assyrians, in bondage in Babylon, in bondage everywhere they have been in their lives and yet they were telling a lie. Many people are like that. They are in bondage to tobacco and alcohol, in bondage to the fleshly practices of the world and yet they say that they belong to God. They are never in bondage. That's a lie. We shouldn't tell lies in the presence of God. Neither should we tell lies anywhere we find ourselves the Lord came so that he'll take them out out of their sin out of their bondage and out of the addiction that they had in the world but he said to the one who was to deliver them to the one who was to bring them out to the one who was to set them free when he said if the son therefore shall make you free ye shall be free indeed he said how can we be free whenever in bondage to any man how sayest thou ye shall be made free look at verse 34 in verse 34 it tells us and jesus answered verily verily i say unto you whosoever committed sin whosoever makes a practice of sinning whosoever committed continually habitually committed sin is the servant of sin it's in bondage to sin and our ministry is to bring them out out of the corruption of the world of sin out of the captivity of sin and out of the condemnation of sin it is when we do that in our messages it's when we do that in our approach it's when we do that in our calling them out to repentance and they come out of that that's when ministry begins it tells us in verse 35 in verse 35 the servant abided not in the house forever but the son abided ever and then in verse 36 now it says if the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. Will be free. I'm free indeed. And while they were still arguing and debating as to whether they are there or not there, whether they were in bondage and needed freedom 
or not he told them in verse 44 in verse 44 ye of your father the devil and the loss of your father ye will do he was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there was no truth in him when he speaketh a lie he speaketh of his own for he is a liar and the father of each the well is very clear then as moses brought the people out of egypt the Lord expects us in the ministry, in the charge, in the commission he has given us that will bring the people out of their sin. You preach repentance, you preach faith in Christ. And as they accept that and believe that, the grace of God works in their lives. They are justified by faith, their faith in Christ, justification. We're coming to number two here. In number two, blot out Egypt from the people that is from the minds of the people is something you know the children of Israel yes they came out of Egypt in the physical in the natural and we can tell even Pharaoh could tell and the Egyptians could tell they came out of Egypt but the problem with them is that Egypt did not easily come out of them. Look at Numbers chapter 14. In Numbers chapter 14, reading from verse 3, And wherefore, as the Lord brought us unto this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and our children should be a prey, were it not better for us to return into Egypt, Egypt never led their minds. And we look at the people who say they are born again and they are saved and they are called out of the world and everything they do in their practice, everything they do in their ceremonies, everything they do in their celebrations, it's, it's just like the world. They're going to have a burial like the world. They're going to have naming ceremony like the world. They're going to get married like the world. They're going to do and even their office his work and their whatever they're doing is you cannot tell the difference because although they profess to come out of the world the world has not come out of them the children of Israel had come out in the physical in the natural they had come out of Egypt but Egypt was still very much inside them look at verse 4 in verse 4 he tells us and he said one to another let us us make a captain we need another leader this one Moses his mind is totally of Egypt he will not agree to take us back to Egypt he will not agree to allow us practice all the practices and the principles and the proverbs and all the things that the Egyptians do he will not allow us to do it here in his presence let's choose a captain and let us return into Egypt we have a great ministry that as well preaching as we're ministering the people coming out of Egypt coming out of the world that is one thing and the world and Egypt coming out of them that they are totally separated in mind and spirit in heart in body from Egypt that is the charge we have that is the commission we have it tells us in verse 5 in verse 5 it says the Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the people of the congregation of the children of Israel. The Lord does not want us, does not want you, I, and, and you, you, and I, and our congregation still to have Egypt in our mind. To turn back to the things of the world. It tells us in Hebrews chapter 10, reading from verse 38. Hebrews Chapter 10, reading from verse 38. Now, the just shall live 
by faith the just justification they're justified they're taken out of their sin by faith in christ they're taken out of the world and the whole system of the world by repentance and faith in christ and because of that they're forgiven they're set free they're justified they become the just in the sight of the lord now the just shall live by faith but if any man draw back my soul shall have no pleasure in him if the minds of the people are still wedded to the world if the attractions of the world are still much of their problem it says if any man draws back my soul shall have no pleasure in him and then in verse 39 it says but we are not of them who draw back unto perdition those israelites when they said let us choose ourselves a captain and let us return unto egypt they were going to return to perdition everything that oppressed them before everything that bound them before if they return to egypt all the oppression will come back all the bondage will come back and the judgment that came upon the egyptians the same thing will come upon them that's the reason why they needed to have egypt out of them and that's the reason why all the people we minister to were bringing them out of egypt and were bringing egypt Egypt out of them and it says in verse 39 but we are not of them who draw back unto perdition but of them that believe to the saving of the soul let's look at number three number three we're looking at binding the people to the eternal binding the people to the eternal you cannot live in a vacuum your mind your heart has to cleave unto the lord that's why moses reminded them every time that you are out of egypt Egypt shall be out of you, and then you shall so live with the Lord that you are cleaving unto the Lord. It tells us in Deuteronomy chapter 10, reading from verse 20, it says, Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God. Him shall thou serve, and to him shall thou cleave and swear by his name to cleave there is to be so glued and joined unto the lord that only death can separate you from the outward uh, worship here and then you go to be with him eternally that thou you shall cleave unto the lord and hey, look at chapter 13 and i'm reading from verse 1 in chapter 13 of deuteronomy verse 1 it says if there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and give it thee a sign and a wonder then in verse 2 it says and the sign of the wonder come to pass whereof he spake unto thee saying let us go after other gods which thou hast not known and let us serve them then in verse 3 it says thou shalt not hearken thou shalt not listen thou shalt not give attention thou shalt not give a listening ear to such a person unto the words that the prophet so called prophet that the dreamer so called dreamer of dreams is telling you and then it says for the Lord your God proveth you to know whether ye love the Lord Lord, your God with all your heart and with all your soul then in verse 4 it says ye shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice look at this and ye shall serve him and cleave unto him you'll be so glued unto him that nothing and tear you away from the Lord. You are so glued to the Lord and you are cleaving to the Lord that the riches of this world, the promises of this world, these prospects in this world, and the politics of this world, and anything in the world will not make you to depart from the Lord. That he cleave 
unto him. Is there any difference in the New Testament? Not at all. We're looking at Acts chapter 11 verse 23. Acts chapter 11 verse 23. When he came and had seen the grace of God, he saw the grace of God, they had been called out of the world. They had been called out of their sin. They had been justified, justified, and they had been saved from their sins by the grace of God. The grace that brought salvation had appeared unto them, teaching them to deny ungodliness and worldly laws and to live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world. And then he says he saw the grace of God he was glad and he exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they will cleave unto the Lord cleave unto the Lord out of Egypt Egypt out of our members out of the people will bring to the Lord and they cleave unto the Lord they are bound by the cord of love eternal love unto the Lord. We're coming to point number two here. Point number two, the uppermost mandate, bring the pilgrims through the barren land. The uppermost mandate, the mandate the Lord has given us that we will get them through. There are many things that, uh, you know, the people of God will still pass through while we're here in the world. But we're passing through. We're passing through. We shouldn't make whatever challenges we have in this wilderness of a world to make us sit down and to make us give up and to make us resign our life, our destiny into the hands of the God of this world because we're supposed to pass through the uppermost mandate the mandate the Lord has given us as ministers, as professionals as fathers and mothers and leaders over the people of God, make sure that your influence, your inspiration, your message your lifestyle brings them out of Egypt and then you don't leave them there, that's how we do follow up so that you take them through and they pass through this wilderness, the barren land. I look at Psalm 106 and I'm reading from verse 9. Psalm 106 verse 9, he rebuked the Red Sea also. Every blockage and every hindrance, every hurdle before them, he cleared that out of the way so that they can pass through. Now, they didn't live on the other side of the Red Sea. They sank, that's good. They glorified God as good. He testified as good. He said, what a God is this? It's a mighty God that's good. They didn't settle there. They were to move on. In our lives, that's the same thing. We do not settle anywhere in the wilderness. The water might come out of the rock. We don't settle there. We might gather manna, a, a particular money. We don't settle there. We might conquer the Amalekites anytime in the wilderness we don't settle there all the experiences we have in the wilderness is not to invite us to settle down and to dwell there and to abide there is to tell us the Lord who can do this in the barren land the Lord who can do this in the wilderness when you get to the land of promise how much how much how much will he do never settle in the wilderness of the world whatever you are having there you have to move on and the Lord is taking you through as pilgrims in this barren land look at verse look at verse 10 in verse 10 he says and he saved them from the hand of him that hated them and redeemed them from the hand of the enemy it tells us in Jeremiah chapter 2 and I'm reading from verses 6 and 7 Jeremiah chapter 2 verse 6 neither said they where is the Lord that brought us out of the land of Egypt and led us through 
Let us through, let us through, always understand that, leading us through. Let us through the wilderness and through a land of deserts and of peace, through a land that's of drought and of the shadow of death, through a land that no man passed through and when no man dwelt and then in verse 7 in verse 7 and i brought you into a plentiful country always have that goal that peak that destiny that destination in mind out of through and then into i brought you into a plentiful country to eat the fruit thereof and the goodness thereof but when ye entered in ye defiled the land that is all the defilement in their memory in their mind of egypt they carried it on because Egypt, the pollutions of Egypt never left their mind, and so they defiled my land and make mine heritage an abomination. We're looking at three things here. Number one, we're looking at abundant provision during the wilderness journey. As was bringing them through, he also supplied all their needs. But it's to assure them, if I can do this for you in the barren land, what do you think I will do when you get to Beulah land? Because number one, abundant provision was given to them through the wilderness journey. Number two, <clears throat> God bless you. Number two, adequate preaching throughout the wilderness jungles adequate preaching throughout the wilderness jungles it was like a jungle and the wild animals were there and the wild people were there and the idol worshippers were there and the various nations confronted them and, and therefore they near preaching all the time that will search their mind and search their focus and search their faith on the place they were supposed to get to and we must give adequate preaching adequate exhortation adequate encouragement adequate message of faith and life uh, to the people so that they will not look back and think that well here we are we're not far from Egypt yet can we can we still go back adequate preaching throughout the wilderness jungles number three is appropriate prevention of the wilderness judgments judgments came in the wilderness upon the disobedient upon the defiant upon the rebellious upon the backsliders upon the sinful and it was uh, the ministry and the calling of Moses the leader to help them prevent all those uh, judgments in the wilderness let's come to number one number one is the abundant provision during the wilderness journey abundant provision in Deuteronomy chapter 2 reading from verse 7 Deuteronomy chapter 2 verse 7 for the Lord thy God has blessed thee in all the works of thy hand he knoweth thy walking through this great wilderness he knows that you are walking through I always understand whenever we mention the wilderness they're always walking through and going through they are not abiding they are not dwelling there and all the provision of the Lord that the Lord gave them it was to make them walk through this wilderness great wilderness these 40 years the lord thy god has been with thee and thou has lacked nothing they had abundant provision as we're going through the wilderness journey look at chapter 8 of Deuteronomy reading from verse 1 it says in chapter 8 verse 1 all the commandments which I command thee this day ye shall uh, shall ye observe to do that ye may live and multiply and go in 
that she may live. All that God has provided through this wilderness is that she may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers. As ministers, we keep on reminding the people of heaven. Heaven is our goal. That's the promised land. That's our goal. The place where Christ said, In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And when I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, so that where I am, there ye may be also. Our mind, our heart, our intention, our drive shall always be towards the that land that the Lord himself has gone to prepare. And Moses was to remind the people all the time, you are going through, you are going through, you are going through, that you may go in and possess the land that the heavenly father has sworn unto your fathers. Look at verse 2. In verse 2, it tells us, and thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these 40 years in the wilderness. Led you always on the move uh, in the wilderness you don't say children you're always on the move uh, and you want to find out when am I getting there when am I entering uh, and then it says it's to prove you and to know what was in your heart whether that would keep his commandments or no and then in verse 3 he assures us and he humbled thee and suffered thee uh, permitted thee to hunger to, to be hungry and he led thee, and he fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know that he might make thee to know that man does not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord does man live. And then in verse 4, he reminds us thy raiment wax not old upon thee, neither did thy food swell these forty years. Adequate provision, abundant provision for them in their wilderness journey. How about us today? What are we saying concerning the people of God that were leading? It tells us in John chapter 10 verse 10 it says, the thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy but I am come that they might have life and that they might have that life abundantly while we're on a journey to heaven from justification to glorification and in the middle the sanctification part of it it wants us to know that whatever we need in our journey the joy of the Lord being our strength and the peace of God and the provision of God and the healing and the deliverances and everything but understand the healing the deliverance the provision the prosperity is not to make us settle here is to make us go through the wilderness journey with adequate provision and with adequate uh, adequate thing that the Lord has given unto us he says I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly second Corinthians, I'm reading from chapter 9 and verse 8. Second Corinthians chapter 9, reading from verse 8, and God is able to make all grace about toward you that she always having always having always having in our journey like he provided for the children of Israel the same way he provides for us it says that she always having all sufficiency in all things try and analyze that in your personal life in your ministry in other people your ministry too that it says everyone can have always 
all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work that we may be able to do everything he has called us to do while we're passing through the wilderness jungle look at number two here number two we're looking at adequate preaching throughout the wilderness jungles throughout the wilderness jungles and uh, and Moses kept the charge the charge the Lord had called him to and we, we read in Deuteronomy chapter 4 reading from verse 2 it says ye shall not add unto the word which I command you neither shall ye diminish or subtract out from it that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you he was always encouraging them always exhorting them always bringing the mind of God and the message of God to them always telling them it's not just about manna alone it's not just about drinking water out of the rock alone he has given us his word and we're to, we're to obey his word and it is in the obedience of that word is taking us through the jungle the wilderness a jungle so that we'll arrive at the place we're going thank God we will arrive I will arrive and your congregations and the people under your influence will arrive in Jesus name Amen. look at uh, chapter 12 uh, chapter 12 of Deuteronomy verse 32 in chapter 12 verse 32 it said what things soever I command you observe to do it one thinks what things soever the word of God is not for debate the word of God is not for discussion. The word of God is not for sifting and choosing. I like that. I don't like that. That one goes against the flesh. And that one condemns all the pollutions of the world. And all the practices of Egypt. I don't like that. It's not what you like. What you don't like is the word of God. And it says, what things soever I command you, observe to do it, that thou and thou shall not add thereto nor diminish from it. Now we come to the New Testament because we're, we're having this, uh, you know, in Old Testament, New Testament, every time because of the transferable concept that what Moses did for the children of Israel, what are we to do to the people we're ministering to? We're looking at Matthew chapter 28, reading from verse 18. In Matthew 28 verse 18 and Jesus came and spake unto them saying all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth then in verse 19 it says go ye therefore and teach all nations baptizing them when you teach them you teach them repentance you teach them faith in Christ and as they believe they believe and they are baptized in water they'll be saved and said baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Look at verse 20. It says, teaching them teaching them after we brought them out of egypt egypt out of them and by consecration commitment they are bound to the eternal then comes in the wilderness journey we're teaching them the word of god because christ wants us to bring them to heaven and to bring them to the promised land and there's no way to do that without showing them the mighty of God, the word of God, the will of God, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. All things, ah, that means we're not to specialize in healing. Jesus healed, he went beyond healing all things. We're not to specialize in deliverance. Yes, he delivered the people from the attacks and afflictions of the demons. He went beyond that. And he's saying we should do the same. We're not only to talk of healing, only to talk of deliverance, only to talk of prosperity, only to talk of, you know, bearing children, only to talk of physical, natural miracles. He wants us to teach them all things whatsoever 
ever I have commanded you. And he says on the grounds of that, on the basis of that, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. And the whole church said, Amen. Amen. Uh, you know, uh, many, many times you, you think about, you know, different ministers. That one specializes in healing. That one specializes in holiness. That one specializes in prosperity. That one specializes in deliverance. Uh -uh. There's no specialization because Jesus Christ, our Lord and Master, our Messiah, and the one who has committed the ministry into our hands, he didn't specialize. He just taught everything. And now he commands us. He says, I give you the baton, and I give you the ministry, I give you the charge, I give you the commission. You teach them all things whatsoever I have commanded you. May the Lord find you faithful in Jesus' name. What if you have a specialized before, and the people, the people that wanted healing and deliverance will come to your ministry. Now you open up and you look at Christ. What else should I be teaching? I'm not teaching. What else? What else should I be emphasizing? I'm not emphasizing. What else should I be ministering to the people? I'm not ministering to the people. And as you do that, then you are able to have a well-rounded ministry, a complete ministry, ministering to the soul, to the spirit, to the body of all the people and ministering to their character and to their commitment and their consecration, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you and lo he'll be with you till the end of the world. We're looking at Acts of the Apostle chapter 20 and I'm reading from verse 26 Acts chapter 20 verse 26, and Paul the Apostle said, wherefore I take you to record this day that I'm pure from the blood of all men. I'm pure from the blood of all men. Why? Look at verse 27 in verse 27, for I have not shunned, I have not neglected to declare clear unto you all the counsel of God. You are not free from the blood of all men. If they don't know that if they backslide, they're going back to perdition. You are not free from the blood of all men. If they don't know what the Bible calls sin, and that God wants to deliver us and take us away from sin, and take sin away from us. Paul the apostle said, now I can relax. Now I can say, I am pure from the blood of all men because I have not charged to declare unto you the counsel of God. Verse 28, in verse 28, take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God. To feed the church of God. To feed the church of God. What well, you know about feeding our body. What if you come for break fast and you know your wife or whoever is serving you serves that same food is, is she served last night and then in the afternoon for lunch the same food and then in the evening the same food and then the following day the same food all through the week the same food all through the month the same food all through the year the same food is, is, is there nothing else in the market my goodness what why are you doing this all the time it says I I like that and I think you like that too. You know in the church sometimes we'll come and the minister is talking about salvation. That's good. He comes again. He talks about salvation. He comes again every Sunday and every weekday about salvation and about the grace of God that saves us. It's not of works. It's uh, you know by the gift of God all through the year and the following year and we're asking pastor, minister, is there no other message there? No message of sanctification there, only salvation. No message of holiness there, only salvation. No message of the rapture there, only no message of healing there. No message of deliverance there. No message of one man, one wife until death do us part. Why is it we concentrate on just this one kind of meal? That's not a balanced diet. And so it says in verse 28, take heed therefore unto 
yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God. Look at the epistles. Let's take, for example, the epistle to the Corinthians. You see all the doctrines. You see everything there and come to Ephesians and you see all the doctrines there and come to Colossians and you see everything there. And the apostles were not only talking of one subject, one subject, one subject, all through their messages. Feed the church of God with balanced diet. God will help you. God will help every one of us. It says, which he purchased with his own blood. Let's look at number three here. Number three here is the appropriate prevention of the wilderness judgments. Appropriate prevention of the wilderness judgment. We're looking at Psalm 78. I was reading from verse 17. It says, And they sin yet more against him by provoking the most high in the wilderness. In the wilderness. They provoked him by the works of their hand, by the words of their mouth, and by the walk of their feet, and by their lifestyle. They provoked the Almighty. Look at verse 18. In verse 18, And they tempted God in their heart by asking not meat for their loss. And then in verse 19, it tells us in verse 19, it says, Yea, they speak against God. They said, Can God, can God, can God furnish a table in the wilderness? Verse 21, in verse 21, Therefore the Lord had this, and it was wrath. So a fire was kindled against Jacob, and anger also came up against Israel. Look at verse 22 there. In verse 22, because they believed not in God. They came out of Egypt. They believed not in God. They ate the manna. They believed not in God. They drank the water out of the rock. They believed not in God. Have you noticed that if we don't keep on teaching our members, they will not believe in God? Yes, I know they believe in the pastor. If the pastor will pray for me, I'll be healed. They do not believe that the promises of God will work with them. If they pray on their own. And if the pastor they believed in, if he prays and nothing happens, then they say the papas in the village and the people that you know use a chalk and a cockroach or whatever, they go back to them. They believe not in God. That's the reason why it's very important that we always keep their focus and their mind on the Lord Almighty. Not on ourselves because once they don't get what they're looking up for to us, they don't get it from us, then they go to the people in the village and then they backslide and they waste their lives and they waste your time and waste your ministry. Look at verse 30. In verse 30, it says, They were not estranged from their lost. All their desires they brought out of Egypt, they were not cut off from them. The, uh, the preaching did not do enough for them to cut them away from the laws of Egypt. But while the meat was yet in their mouth in verse 31, it says the wrath of God came upon them and slew the, fast, the fattest of them and smote down the chosen men of Israel. Verse 32, in verse 32, for all this the sin does steal. For all this the sin steal. You understand? The ministry will have justification, sanctification, glorification. Justification brought out of Egypt. But Egypt coming out of them, lost coming out of them, corruption coming out of them. This sanctification part, they didn't have that. And they just went through the wilderness and many of them couldn't get into the land of Canaan because for all this, they still seal still and believe not for his wondrous works. It tells us then in verse 36, in verse 36, nevertheless, they did flatter him 
with their mouth and delight unto him with their tongues. The next verse in verse 37, it says, For their heart was not right with him. They came out of Egypt, and you see them singing at the time they let the Red Sea, and when they drank the water out of the rock, you see the joy, you think that these are great worshippers, but it says their heart was not right with him, neither were they steadfast in his covenant. In verse 40, it tells us about the summary of their life. How much did they provoke him in the wilderness and grieve him in the desert? Verse 41, it says, Yea, they turned back. They tempted God and they limited the Holy One of Israel. With all that Moses did, with all his ministry, ministration, message, everything to them, this is where they were. How about us? Are we even doing as much as Moses did? Reminding the people of the covenant of God. Reminding the people of their commission in God. Reminding the people of their commitment, consecration unto God. That's a ministry and we should not allow ourselves to only pitch our tent on come out, come out, come out. Yes, we have come out. Tell us the next thing. And then in the wilderness, as we are going through this jungle of the wilderness, tell us all the things we need to know so that our mind, our heart, our eyes, our face, our focus will be on that promised land. I pray we'll get there in Jesus' name. Look at Hebrews chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 12. Hebrews chapter 3, we're looking at verse 12. It's talking to the Jews, talking about the children of Israel. Again, transferable concept. Concept. It happened to them. And we look at that, we look at their pitfalls, so that the same thing will not happen to us. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12, take heed, brethren. These are brethren now. The first part has taken place, justification, coming out of the world. Now, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Look at verse 13. In verse 13, but exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. And then in verse 14, it says, For we are made partakers of Christ. If there's a condition there, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. In verse 15, it says, while it is said today, if you will hear his voice, had he not your hearts, as in the provocation, verse 16, for some, when they had heard, did provoke, how be it, not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. Verse 17, it says, but with whom? Was he grieved those 40 years? Was it not for them that had sinned whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? In verse 18, it says, For to whom swear he that they should not enter into his race, but to them that believed not. Remember, it's not talking about those who have never known the miracles of the Lord. It's talking about those who have come out of Egypt and they were now in the wilderness, but they did not set their hearts right to believe in the Lord all, all the way through. Verse 19, it says so. We see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Chapter 4 verse 1. In chapter 4 verse 1 it's telling us, it says let us therefore fear lest a promise be let us of entering into his race. Any of you should seem to come short of it. Then in verse 2, it says, For unto us was the gospel, the good news preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them. The word preached did not profit them. Not 
be mix of faith in them that heard it. And then in verse 11, in verse 11, let us labor, therefore, we're born again. Let us labor, therefore, we're justified. Let us labor, therefore, we have come out of Egypt. Let us labor, therefore, we have fulfilled the first leg of the whole cycle, of the whole journey, justification. Now we move on to the life of sanctification. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of all belief. We're coming now to point number three. In point number three, we're looking at the ultimate mastery. The ultimate mastery, bring them purified into Beulah. Bring them into the promised land, the pleasant land, the perfect land. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 6. Again, we're looking at verse 23. It says, He brought us out from this, that He might bring us in. He brought us out for the purpose, for the reason, for the goal that He might bring us in. And then it said, To give us the land which is where unto our fathers have that purpose in mind every time anytime you do ministry and you're successful understand that's not the end going or anytime you do ministry and god answers your prayer and god provides for you and god provides land for the church and god provides all that the church needs and then we bought this we've got that and then we're mo moving on in ministry and people can even look up to us and say that they compare their success with what you're doing and you become the yardstick that they're looking at if i can do as much as that if i can go as far as that if I can achieve as much as that, I will say I've got something. Watch out, watch out. Because you see, we're still over here in this period of going through the sanctification period. And then you want to go to the glorification, the final end that the Lord will bring you to that perfect land. He'll bring you to be like He'll bring you there in Jesus' name. We're looking at uh, we're looking at Hebrews chapter 11, and I'm reading from verse 9. Hebrews 11 verse 9, by faith is a judge in the land of promise as in a strange country dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob. They heirs with him of the same promise. In verse 14, it says, for they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. They seek a country. They've got this. They seek a country. The Lord has blessed them they seek a country. And the Lord multiplied all that Isaac sowed that year a hundredfold and yet they seek a country. We've got the blessings of the Lord, the provision of the Lord and they seek a country. We've got all the things we're looking for in that uh, office. They're giving us the papers they need to give us and yet they're seeking a country in our heart, in our mind. Whatever success we have in the present day ministry, we're still seeking Seeking a country and seeking a country. Beulah land, promised land, the perfect land and a pleasant land. Look at verse 16. In verse 16 it says, But now they desire a better country, that is, and heavenly. Wherefore God is not ashamed to be their God, to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. That's the final thing. And that's where we're going. The glory when we enter, we enter with him and he has prepared for us a city. Look at Isaiah chapter 62 and verse 4. Isaiah chapter 62 verse 4. Thou shalt no more be termed forsaken, neither shall thy land any more be termed desolate, but thou shalt be called Hephzibah and thy land Beulah and thy land Beulah. That is when you get to that promised land that is flowing with milk and honey. And it says, now this 
is Beulah, and the Lord, for the Lord delighteth in thee, and thy land shall be married. We're looking at three things there before we bring everything to a conclusion. Number one, presenting the perfect picture of the promised land. Presenting the perfect picture of the promised land. Never, never, never allow the thought of Egypt and the picture of Egypt and the remembrance of Egypt remain in the hearts of the people. Bring before them the perfect picture of the promised land. Number two, preparing the purified people for the pleasant land. The pleasant land land is the same as the promised land. Number three, possessing a permanent portion in the perfect land. That you have the assurance within. You have the consecration, the commitment in your heart that whatever happens here in this wilderness journey, that you have a permanent portion in that perfect land the land of glory and the land of beauty and the land where you have god and christ and the holy spirit and the angels and the justified and the saints of god all that have gone and they died in the lord the land where when we are raptured will be there will be forever there will the lord always think about the perfect land that everything you do everything you dream everything you have everything you possess everything you pray for is leading you to that land the perfect land. look at number one here number one we're looking at presenting the perfect picture of the promised land before the people in Deuteronomy chapter 8 reading from verse 7 it says for the Lord thy God bringeth thee into a good land a land of brooks of water of uh, fountains and depths that spring out of the valleys and the hills. And then in verse 8 it says, a land of wheat, a land of barley, a land of vines, a land of fig trees, a land of pomegranates, and a land of oil, olive, and a land of honey. And then in verse 9 it says, a land wherein thou shalt eat bread without scarceness, and thou shalt not lack anything in it, a land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills thou mayest dig brass. Moses presented a perfect picture before them so that he lit up their expectation, he lit up their, uh, their appreciation of that land that the Lord himself has provided. Look at chapter 11 of Deuteronomy and I'm reading from verse 9. In verse 9 it says, and that he may prolong your days in the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers to give unto them and to their seed a land that floweth, floweth, floweth every season of the year. There's no dry season and there's no drought, there's no famine because it's a land that keeps on flowing with milk and honey. And then in verse 10 it says, For the land whither thou goest to possess it is not as the land of Egypt. It's way far beyond Egypt. And it says, From whence ye came out where thou sowed thy seed and watered it with thy foot. That is, they'll have to take um, you know, jerry can or whatever and then bring water there and use uh, the hose to be watering everything that was in Egypt. It says, this land you are going to is very different, it's fruitful. And it says in verse 11, it tells us in verse 11, but the land whither ye go to possess it is a land of hills and valleys and drinketh the water of the rain of heaven and then in verse 12 it says a land which the Lord thy God 
careth for. The eyes of the Lord thy God are always upon it from the beginning of the year even unto the end of the year. Moses painted a bright picture, a good picture, a desirable picture in, the fr in front of the people so that they will forget where they're coming from and they will make them themselves look intently and diligently on the land where they are going. And, and the same thing we have to do as we're ministering to the people of God that we lift up their eyes and their face and their mind and their desire and their focus on the land where we are going. In Hebrews chapter 11 reading from verse 14 it says Hebrews 11 verse 14 for they that say such things they clear plainly that they seek a country. In verse 15 it says and truly if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out they might have had the opportunity to have returned. Then in verse 16 but now they seek they desire a better country that is and heavenly where, wherein or wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God for he has prepared for them a city. Chapter 12 reading from verse 22 Hebrews chapter 12 verse 22 but she had come unto Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an, uh, to an innumerable company of angels. Verse 23, it says, and to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are reaching in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. In verse 24, it says, And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling, that speaketh better things than that of Abel, but to lift up the minds of the people towards heaven so that they know that this world is not their home and we're going to a better place number two here number two is preparing the purified people for the pleasant land as the Lord has going to prepare the place for us we ourselves need to be prepared for that place is going to prepare for us we're looking at Daniel chapter 12 reading from verse 3 it says and they that be wise shall shine at the brightness of the firmament and they that turn many to righteousness at the stars for Ever and ever turning others to righteousness making them to have the grace of God that brings righteousness and holiness in their hearts in their lives and making them to remain to abide in the Lord and the grace of the Lord that brings a salvation and sanctification and holiness and purity of heart because without the purity of heart no man shall see the Lord it tells us in um, Titus chapter 2 and I'm reading there from verse 11 in Titus chapter 2 verse 11 for the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men tell them then if it's available for all men that grace of God the grace that forgives that sets free that saves that justifies tell them we shouldn't be talking of other irrelevant things on important non-essential things tell them about the grace of God that bringeth salvation that has appeared to all men. Then in verse 12, it says, Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly laws, we should live soberly. Live soberly. You know, sometimes it looks like, you know, our churches, they, they gamble with their lives. They joke about eternal things. And they joke about the non-negotiables of the gospel. And the pastor never says anything about that. He just wants them to go on, uh, you know, uh, cajoling themselves and deceiving and deluding themselves. It says that when the grace of God comes to us, we live so 
soberly and righteously and godly in this present world. And then in verse 13, in verse 13, looking for that blessed hope. That's a, that's a glory. We're looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, verse 14, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works what that's what we do that's what we prepare the people for so that we're preparing the people purified for the pleasant land first john chapter 3 and i'm reading from verse 1 first john chapter 3 verse 1 behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. And then in verse 2, it says in verse 2, Beloved, now are we the sons of God justified. Now are we the sons of God out of Egypt. Now are we the sons of God out of sin and out of the dominion or domination of the devil the god of this world now are we the sons of god and it does not yet appear what we shall be but we know that when he shall appear we shall be like him you'll be like him for we shall see him as he is. Look at verse 3. And it says, And everyone that has this hope in him, if we don't paint the picture before them, if we don't search heaven before them, if we don't tell them of that eternal pleasant land of glory, how will they desire that? Without desire, how will they have hope? If they have that hope, then they understand that will be prepared purified people so that they can make it on that final day and every man that has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure revelation chapter 19 i'm reading from verse 7 revelation chapter 19 verse 7 let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the lamb is calm and his wife has made herself ready his wife the bride of christ has made herself ready if we don't tell them how to be ready for the rapture how will they make themselves ready if we don't tell them the christian experience the purity of heart and the holiness of life they ought to have so that they can be ready for the coming of the lord how will they make themselves ready that is our ministry that we're telling them every time showing them every time that the depths and the height and the length and everything that the blood of jesus can accomplish in our hearts and our lives so that the wife the bride of christ will make herself ready and then in verse 8 it tells us it says and her and to her was granted that she should be rich in fine linen clean and white for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints we're coming now to point number three there and number three it tells us possessing a permanent portion in the perfect land whatever portion we have here on earth it's like you know in the wilderness we have a shelter there we have a shed there we have a shop there we have habitation there we have a dwelling place there but you know everything is going to vanish away eventually and what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and loses his own soul or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul what should be very important is that we have a permanent portion in that perfect land possessing a permanent portion in the perfect land revelation chapter 2 reading from verse 7 he that has an ear let him hear what the spirit says unto the churches to him that overcometh will i give to each of the tree of life which is in the midst of the paradise of god look at verse 25 in verse 25 but that which ye have 
already hold fast till I come. And then in verse 26, it assures us, He that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end. He that overcometh, temptation will come. He that overcometh, trials will come. He that overcometh, Egyptians will come back and knock at your door. Can we enter in? Can we live inside there and live inside you? He that overcometh, and the Amalekites will come and will want to subject you and suppress you. But he that overcometh, he that is having the Lord before him all the time, because in the presence of the Lord there is fullness of joy. He that overcometh and keepeth my walks unto the end to him will I give power over the nations. Verse 27 in verse 27 and he shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers even as I received of my father. Verse 28 in verse 28 and I will give him the morning star. Verse 29 it says and he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto all the churches. I pray the Lord will give us listening ear obedient heart and a heart that is focused on getting to that promised land, pleasant land, perfect land. We'll get there in Jesus' name. Look at chapter 7, Revelation chapter 7, and I'm reading from verse 9. After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all the nations and the kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and then in verse 10, it says that they cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. In verse 11, it says, And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts, the living creatures, and fell before the throne on their faces and worshipped God. In verse 12, it says, saying amen blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever amen, amen. and then in verse 13 it says in verse 13 and one of the elders answered saying unto me what are these which are arrayed in white robes and whence came they verse 14 says and I said unto him sir thou knowest and he said unto me these are they which came out of the great tribulation and I've washed their robes and I've made them white in the blood of the Lamb. In verse 15, it says, Therefore, I did before the throne of God. I pray you'll get there. Amen. Everything you have on earth should be leading you to the fact that if God can provide this here on earth, what will it be when I appear before the throne of God? When you get to heaven eventually, but if you have all this, all this, all this, and everything, almost uncountable, innumerable, and then you don't get over there, all the things you have had there will be useless, worse than useless. But I pray you'll be there in Jesus' name. That's why it says, therefore, at they before the throne of God, and they serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. In verse 16, it says, And they shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. Then in verse 17, it says, For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. 
Look at chapter 21. Chapter 21, I'm reading from verse 3. That, that's the perfect plan. We're going at the eternal place. We're going. It says in chapter 21, verse 3, it says, And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and be their God. And in verse 4, in verse 4 it says, And God shall wipe away all tears from your eyes, and there shall be no more death, and neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, any more pain of any kind, for the former things have passed away. In verse 5, it tells us, And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Right, 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 for these words are true. And faithful. Then in verse 6, it says in verse 6, and said unto me, it is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is the thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. Then in verse 7, it says, and he that overcometh shall inherit all things shall inherit all things and i will be his god and he shall be my son look at chapter 22 we're reading from verse 3 there chapter 22 verse 3 and there shall be no more curse for the throne of god and of the lamb shall be in it and his servant shall serve him in verse 4 it says and all and they shall see his face and his name shall be in their foreheads in verse 5 it says and, and there shall be no night there they need no candle neither light of the sun for the Lord God giveth them light and they shall reign forever and ever yeah. and they and we shall reign forever and ever. Look at verse 6. In verse 6, it says there, and he said unto me, these sayings are the faithful and are faithful and true. And the Lord God, the holy and the, of the holy prophet, sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. And then in verse 7, it says, Behold, I come quickly. That's our Lord. That's our Savior. That's our Redeemer. That's the one, our forerunner who has gone there to prepare a place for you and for me. And he said when I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. He now says he says, Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he and blessed is she that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. May, may you become one and may you be and remain one of the blessed of the Lord in Jesus. Name. And then in verse 12, in verse 12, and, and behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. In verse 13, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Then in verse 14, it says, Blessed are they that do his commandments that they may have right to the tree of life that they may enter in through the gates into the city the heavenly city number one out of number two we're going through number three we go in and as you have come out you help other people too to come out of the world, out of Egypt, out of sin, and as they're going through triumphantly in this period of her walking with the Lord, walk that before me and without perfect, and we're walking through this wilderness. May you help other people, influence other people, inspire other.
other people that they will walk through as well you will not die in the wilderness and your people the people you are leading and guiding and teaching and preaching to and the people you are influencing will not die in the wilderness but will go in will enter in I am going to enter in I said I'm going to enter in and the people I teach and the people I influence and the people I inspire and the people that I'm taking along with me I'm not going to leave anyone behind because Moses said not a hoof shall we leave behind you lead everyone until we all get into the land in Jesus name the promised land, the pleasant land, and the perfect land. And I pray that none of you will miss that place. And our people, too, that we are guiding and leading, will not miss that place in Jesus' name. Amen. A good amen. amen. A great to go in land. Amen. amen. Let's rise up now. Let's rise up now and talk to the Lord that all these that we have learned today will be reaching upon the tables of our heart. We'll not forget them. We'll not leave them behind. Come out of Egypt and let Egypt come out of you and bind yourself with the cord of consecration unto the altar of the Lord and cleave unto the Lord. And going through this wilderness, you will not allow all the practices of Egypt to come back, all the practices of the land in this world to come back and you set your eyes and you set your focus and your faith on that land, the pleasant land, the promised land, the perfect land that we are getting into and the grace of God will abide in your life, abound in your life until you get there in Jesus' name.